It's been five uh, government agencies in the Ukraine have been using it for just over a month now, and now I've conducted over 10,000 searches on the platform. So it's not just for identifying uh, deceased people, but it's useful at checkpoints, uh, refugee situations, and many more other use cases that we never really thought of in the beginning. Hello, and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Drew Harwell. I cover artificial intelligence for The Post. And today we have Juan Tantat. He's the co-founder of Clearview AI. It's a facial recognition company. And he's here to talk about how the software is used in Ukraine and the US and around the world. So Juan, welcome. Uh, thank you, Drew, for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, great. So um, before we dive into how Clearview is used in Ukraine, let's just get a little bit into the software because it's something that has been used in the US, um, around the world by police and, and investigators. So walk us through how it works and how you came up with the idea. Sure, so Clearview AI is a facial recognition search engine. Uh, it works just like Google, but instead of putting in words or text, uh, you upload a photo of a face. So it's used in an after the fact manner, not in real time, uh, to identify perpetrators or victims of crime and has been used successfully in the US by FBI, Homeland Security and many other agencies uh, to you know, uh, help with human trafficking cases, crimes against children, financial fraud, and a lot more. Most notably, uh, it's helpful for the FBI uh, in the January 6th Capitol riots to identify a lot of the perpetrators. Yeah, so let's talk a, a little bit more about that. Um, you know, in February, we had reported on an investor presentation that you had given that said there were more than 3,000 uh, law enforcement agencies, um, including, like you said, the FBI and ICE. Who all is using it now besides them? And, and what are you at now? Is it more than 3,000? How many police forces in the US? Yeah, so that's the latest number we have um, is over 3,100 who used it. Uh, in the U.S., we also have uh, usage as well in, uh, the U in Ukraine. Uh, now we're in six agencies there. Um, and it's a technology that's had a lot of widespread adoption because uh, given the right training and uh, usage, uh, in just a few minutes, um, law enforcement is able to set up their accounts and start solving crimes they never would have solved otherwise. Great. So. Um so they submit a photo, it goes into this facial index, right, that you've said has more than uh, 20 billion images. Uh, where do those images come from and how many are you adding per month? Sure, so um, it, these all come from the public internet. So you can imagine whatever you find in a Google search result. It could be a mugshot website, news websites, you know, educational websites, uh, social media, and again, this is anything that's public. So if your settings for social media are in private, those won't show up in Clearview, just like uh, in Google. And so it's any, anything that's publicly available. And again, instead of searching uh, with text, you upload a photo. Um, and what's really interesting and important is that we've adopted a lot of controls around usage. So we limit this data set just to law enforcement, um, and we also on responsible usage of the technology. And every case uh, that they use, I mean, every search they use on the platform, uh, they have to put in a case number and a crime type, and that allows uh, these um, agencies to conduct effective audits of the technology. Yeah, great. So let's drill into that, because this is the part that I think is uh, really controversial about Clearview. I mean, these were photos that were taken from what you say is the public internet, but these were social networks. Um, you know, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube have um, filed cease and desist orders demanding you delete these photos from your database. They say they were scraped um, illegitimately. Uh, senators have said that these photos were illegitimately obtained and have sort of called on um, federal money to not go to Clearview. Um, you've said, you know, you want to go from 20 billion to potentially 100 billion enough to make uh, the whole world identifiable. Probably a lot of people on this call have photos um, in this database. So what is your defense for why the company should be allowed to take all of these photos that were not posted online for this purpose and use them for this tool that you're, you're selling to the police? So first of all, I would say that the way we collect the information is in compliance with all applicable laws uh, around data collection. 
Uh, we have a really great legal team uh, that handles uh, these kind of issues. Um, and anything that's out there is public information. So what I like to talk about is this is kind of like the digital public square. And you know this information is public already. And if it can be used to help uh, solve crimes and make the public safer, I think that's a really good use case um, of this information. I would say that also when it comes to the size of the database, in the context of trying to identify someone that you don't know who it is. And we have a really good example from Homeland Security of a child uh, pornography case they were able to solve. Um, the more photos you have, the more accurate the database is, the less biased it is, the more likely you are to find the right person. So every photo is a clue that could potentially, you know, identify a victim like a child uh, of child crimes or any kind of the or perpetrator of a crime. So in this kind of context, I think that a larger database is less biased. So Homeland Security uh, in 2019 were using Clearview AI and they had a photo of a person who's molesting a six year old girl. Um, and he was in the back of this child abuse video he was selling online. And it was just a you know grainy face of him. When they put it through Clearview, they only found one image in the database. And this was three billion images at the time. And he was in the background of someone else's publicly available uh, gym selfie. Uh, they were able to find the location of that gym, find the employer, uh, eventually got the name, and now he's doing 35 years in jail and they could save a six-year-old girl. Um, and they say that without Clearview AI, there was no way they would have caught that guy. And so that's really interesting in terms of how any photo could be a clue. Now that we have about 20 billion images, that uh, person has other photos in the database and those have his direct name. So it would have saved even more time for law enforcement uh, to catch that perpetrator and save that child. Yeah, you've brought that case up uh, a number of times and um, I, you know, just to really quick go back to, you know, the companies that have asked Clearview to delete these images. Has Clearview done so? Uh, not at this time. You know, we believe that the way we collect images is just like any other search engine. And, you know, this is stuff in the public domain. And for the purposes that it's being used for, I think uh, they can be very pro-social. Um, I don't think we want to live in a world where any big tech company can send a cease and desist and then control, uh, you know, the public square. So I think it's an issue that is really important because the issue of uh, collecting publicly available online data is not just images, any kind of data. It affects uh, researchers who may be, you know, studying things like uh, discrimination or um, studying other things like misinformation uh, and it affects academics and a whole wide range of other uh, um, types of use cases as well. In that investor presentation from a couple years ago, you know, you had said that Clearview was interested in moving sort of potentially beyond um, US law enforcement, beyond this kind of public safety example that you, you've brought up to potentially working in the financial sector with stores and banks, um, and also potentially doing a, a international expansion. You said you were seeing a rapid international expansion. So could you walk us through really briefly where you're expanding across the world and what other companies you'd be working with? Sure, so there's been previous reporting uh, talking about you know Clearview AI and we've developed this as prototypes, different uh, versions of our technology for retail and banking. Uh, but this data set is uh, used just by uh, governments. There's no go non-governmental use of this data set at this time. Uh, facial recognition is used everywhere today, from ID verification uh, in banking, financial services, airports, and many other places on a consent basis. And I think uh, the consent-based version of facial recognition is the least controversial one where the end user is opting in. So I think it's still very early in terms of understanding this technology and its implications. And what I think is what we see in the last two, three years with this technology deployed in law enforcement is a ton of positive stories about being able to stop and prevent crime and help victims. So I think facial recognition technology has a potential to be a way to prevent crime and fraud uh, as well, because law enforcement, they can only do so much uh, when it comes to um, uh, solving crimes, unfortunately. Um, in that presentation, you had also sort of compared Clearview's accuracy um, and performance to companies in, in China and Russia. 
How important is it in your estimation that the U.S. Uh, have better facial recognition than China and Russia? So I would say that uh, we're very proud to have really high rankings on NIST. So NIST tested over 650 algorithms from around the world. Um, and if you take the average of the different categories in there, Clearview AI ranked second, with the number one being a Chinese company called SenseTime. And so I think you'd always want more accuracy when it comes to facial recognition. Uh, but I'd draw a quick, you know, sharp distinction about how it's deployed in authoritarian regimes like Russia and China. Uh, so those countries are deploying facial recognition in a completely real-time way uh, where um, it's all the time. When we're deploying it, it's in an after-the-fact investigative manner. So I think it's really important for the U.S. and its allies to have this technology, but also adapt it and make sure we use it within our uh, moral framework. Yeah, but expanding internationally, I mean, how do you protect against that? How do you control, you know, how the tool is used? Um, walk us through kind of how big Clearview is and what sorts of programs you have to ensure that it's not abused in other countries, not abused by companies that you're selling to in this expanded basis. Sure. So we're actually a very small startup in comparison to many other companies. We're around 50 employees now. Um, we were about 10 employees when we were uh, written about on the front page of the New York Times. So we really care about making sure this technology is used for the right purposes and by the right people. Uh, so when it comes to you know anything international, we would never sell to China, Iran, uh, um, and North Korea, or any country that's partially sanctioned uh, by the U.S. Um, and when we look at these countries, one thing about Clearview is deployed as a cloud service. So they pay uh, for subscriptions. So if there's any violations that are egregious of any uh, terms of service we have, um, or they don't follow uh, a lot of the policies, then we have the ability as a company to revoke access. So this is a technology that you can uh, take back uh, if you see you know, major egregious abuse. So I think that we've taken a um, slower approach to making sure we get the technology and uh, learning as much about it here in the US. So the Government Accountability Office wrote two reports last year on the deployment of facial recognition, and they made a lot of uh, suggestions and guidelines about how to deploy it in uh, law enforcement contexts. For example, making sure that there are cybersecurity audits, that the audits uh, possible of the search history of every person who has access to the technology, that there is training. So having figured out uh, a lot of the model here in the US, when we uh, look at other countries on a case by case basis, we want to make sure that we're comfortable that they um, are using it for the right reasons. We'd never want this to be used to, uh, you know, uh, surveil journalists or in any kind of abusive way. Yeah, but when you talk about egregious abuse, I mean, how would you know if it was used to surveil, as you said, you know, the wrong people? Like, what sorts of systems or do you have to ensure that the FBI isn't misusing this tool? What what kind of insight do you have even into what searches they're able to run? Sure. So what we do is when we talk to the customers, we suggest that they uh, and highly, highly encourage them to have a facial recognition policy. So that way they're talking to the public about what crimes it's used for, what crimes it's not. In the process of training uh, these organizations, we get a very good sense of uh, how seriously they take the technology and the tool and the use cases that they have. Um, and everyone who is using it, they know that the administrator in their agency is overseeing the searches and can audit those at any time. And so we give these agencies all the tools they need to communicate with the public uh, about how they use it. And also they can easily generate reports on the type of usage. Now, you know, we're not perfect. We can't see everything that's happening. I don't think it's our role to look, monitor every search, but we're considering and we're always thinking about more ways to make this a, a safe technology in terms of deployment. And on the flip side, you know, we've never had any wrongful arrest or misidentification due to the use of our technology. Um, and you know, when we weigh that against the amazing positive use cases in terms of solving crimes against children or the capital riots and, and you know, these really major things, uh, we think we're striking the right balance. How many allegations of um, abuse or how many sort of reports of potential misuse have you been given um, in these you know many years that you've had all these clients? So as a company like we haven't had you know direct reports of abuse but I would have to check to see how many customers have gone into the tool and revoked access 
Uh, we haven't kept exact numbers on it, but they have all the tools to do it. And that's just one of our you know, top priorities is improving uh, all these uh, controls. So we're the first company to require a case number and a crime type before doing a facial recognition search. Uh, none of the other vendors in the space have done that. And so we're glad to set the standard and we're thinking of more ideas in terms of accounting and reporting. One thing that we've added in our 2.0 version is better analysis of the workflow. So as these um, investigations start, uh, the administrators can track, you know, has a person been identified? Have they been arrested? And get better statistics and fidelity into it. Yeah, okay. Well, let's, um, you know, you had mentioned uh, having 10 employees not all that long ago, um, you know, and you've certainly grown. Um, uh, talk a little bit about your investors. I mean, we've heard that, you know, Peter Thiel is obviously an investor in, in the companies. He's, you know, the billionaire behind Palantir, another data uh, mining company. Um, who are the investors and how has that changed over the last couple of years? Sure. So we have a wide variety of investors from all different backgrounds, uh, a lot of family offices and institutional funds as well um, uh, at various stages of the company. So um, we're well capitalized by, uh, you know, in our last round by institutional investors and larger family offices. And some of them would rather just, you know, uh, invest and they help out and support us that way. Um, we have like Naval Ravikant who was an early investor in my previous companies in uh, the Bay Area uh, where I used to live. And so we're very appreciative from uh, all our investors for their support. Um, and as the company grows, you know, the investor base has changed to become more, you know, serious institutional money. Um, and uh, they've been, you know, big believers in the mission from day one, each one of them, and um, continue to support us. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk about um, the, the start of Clearview, you know, in 2020, um, Luke O'Brien of the Huffington Post had reported that some of your earliest sort of um, co-workers were, you know, had these deep longstanding ties to far right extremists. Um, uh, Charles Johnson, who's, you know, sort of a, a, a right wing activist, has said he was a co-founder of the company, has shown documents suggesting he even had stock. What is that background about? And uh, you know, how, how, how has the company changed? And if, if you do have those ties to the far right, why should people trust you today? Yeah, thanks, Drew. I'm glad you brought up that question. Um, so, you know, there's no political motivation to Clearview. We have people from every side of the political spectrum, uh, from the left, on the right, that work here. There's no left wing way or right wing way to help law enforcement catch a pedophile or solve any kind of crimes. Um, you know, Charles, some, Charles Johnson is someone I met uh, in 2016 who made some introductions, but he's not a co-founder of Clearview. He's never been an employee, a director, uh, or on the board, and never had any active involvement in the company. Uh, what I can tell you is about who I am, where I'm from. I was born and raised in Australia, and I spent my whole entire technology uh, career in technology since uh, I moved when I was 19 to the Bay Area. So that's been my focus, is always on technology, and making sure that this is something that's used in the public interest. And so there's no um, connection there. Uh, okay, interesting. Um, so I, I wanna bring up a question from the audience. Joseph Oyer from Florida asks, does the potential harm from the use of facial recognition software by authoritarian governments outweigh the benefits of this technology? Yeah, I think it's a great question. At, at the end of the day, facial recognition is a technology and it can be deployed in many different ways. The way we like to deploy it at Clearview is uh, in after the fact investigations. So it's not, you know, authoritarian countries are deploying it right now anyway, uh, regardless of, and they've developed their own facial recognition technology. So what we want to do is help try and set an example of good use cases and how it can be uh, used in a positive way. So I don't think um, it's inevitable uh, if that makes any sense that this technology is going to be deployed in the same way here in the uh, in the West. Um, but I do think that uh, the, the, the risks of authoritarian countries using it, um, I just say they are, they are already using it um, in, in a lot of different ways. And just because we develop the technology here doesn't mean we're going to sell it to those kind of countries. Gotcha. 
Okay, well, let's get into Ukraine. And, you know, we're talking about this international expansion. This has been something you've been talking about. We, we reported on this a little bit earlier. Um, this is a use case where Ukraine is using facial recognition in a couple different ways, both at checkpoints um, to scan sort of people coming by, but also to scan the faces of uh, captive Russian soldiers and also uh, dead Russian soldiers, using that data to find their social media profiles and contact their families. Um, it's a controversial use, obviously, but talk, us, uh, talk to us a little bit about how Clearview is used there and, and how widely it's used and, and what kinds of successes you've seen. Sure. So when we first saw the images coming out of Ukraine uh, of all the destruction and damage and victims of war, um, we were thinking as a company, how would we be able to help? One um, of the ideas we had was when they had videos that you might have seen on social media of captured Russian soldiers is perhaps facial recognition could help uh, get more information on who they are. So um, we was reaching out to advisory board and there's one person on there, one of our lawyers, Lee Wolowski, who was previously um, ambassador uh, and also on the National Security Council three times. And he just happened to be meeting people in Ukraine, uh, in the Ukrainian government the next day. So we wrote a letter asking and that they take a look at this technology that would offer it to them for free. It's about a month and a half ago. Um, and somehow they got back to us and we set up the uh, demo of the technology. I helped train a lot of the initial users of it. Um, and it's been a phenomenal response. The ideas we had originally were just the beginning and we've seen many other use cases. So, um, you know, one of them is fighting misinformation in terms of, you know, verifying an identity or as someone on social media and certain claims uh, with the technology. Another one is uh, with the identification of deceased people where we've been able to help them make identities. If you're in a war zone previously, you wouldn't have, uh, say, a fingerprint database or a DNA database of uh, Russian soldiers, for example, uh, because our data set is really large and it contains a lot of information from Russian social media sites, uh, is very effective in uh, making identifications. At checkpoints, it's always good to know uh, who you're dealing with, if they're a potential uh, Russian agent and, or if they are who they say they are, even if they have identification papers. So it's been able to, uh, you know, really verify who people are and decrease uh, the risk of um, identification and more recently the war crimes in Bucha uh, that's been effective to identify people because you can see that uh, their surveillance footage of these so we think it's going to be a really big deterrent to war crimes um, if you know that there is um, a footage and surveillance footage and the ability to be identified um, and also we see you know use cases that you know refugee situations as well where some people don't have any papers with them, or if they do, speeding up that processing time is really important. Um, and so, yeah, we've been honored to help them. And I talk to them on a regular basis almost every day. And we hear some amazing uh, success stories. And they're uh, a great country, great people, they're very brave. And um, I really uh, have enjoyed the process so far. It's been an honor to be able to help out in our way. And, and I know when we had talked last time, they were up to 8,600 or so searches, and you could sort of see from your dashboard how many they're running. What what are they at now? Sure. So we're actually now, I checked this morning, the six agencies using it. Uh, another one signed on. 410 users have been using the technology, so they each have an account to log in and perform searches. Now it's up to 14,809 searches. So each one of these searches is a potential, uh, you know, checkpoint identification of war, a criminal, um, and or, you know, many of these cases. So it's been very uh, heavily used and very effective in practice. We hear just a lot of use cases. And just a few days ago, um, the Minister of Internal Affairs talked about how they've been able to use Clearview. They've opened over, I think, 8,000 criminal proceedings in total. Um, and Clearview has been using a lot of checkpoints, and um, I think they say 700 checkpoints they have with 2,000 officers, and they had no issues, um, you know, recently around the holiday weekend. Uh, so I think that, you know, um, they've seen a lot of adoption there, and they're very hands-on, and we've been, you know, honored just to hear uh, the thanks that I've received and they've received. Um, it's really great. 
but this use case of you know identifying corpses um, and you know reaching out to the Russian families. I mean, it's just you can only imagine how gut wrenching those conversations are to have sort of a stranger reach out and say that your loved one passed away in a foreign battlefield. I mean, was this a use case? That you all had expected when you offered the tool to Ukraine. Do you have any reservations about it being used in that way? Yeah, I think it's one of the ideas that we thought of because we've seen uh, it be able to identify people if they've been deceased uh, previously, um, but we didn't see, think it would be as important as it's turned out to be. Uh, so some of the examples that uh, I've seen where they would have someone with an identification and someone without. This is something that would not be possible in a previous time where, again, you won't have a database of uh, these um, in DNA or fingerprints or anything like that. So, I, you know, war is very gruesome and, um, you know, in any kind of war zone, it is dangerous and this technology can help uh, decrease, you know, misidentification if you really know who you're dealing with. So when we take uh, everyone through all these different scenarios and each scenario as a way to, you know, um, make things safer and better. And in the cases of, you know, victims of war, I think that um, it's really unfortunate, but there's people in Russia who really believe that this war is not happening. They don't know where their family members are and what's really happening. And so I think a sense of closure could be uh, very helpful. Yeah, um, you know, some of the criticism of you all in this scenario has been you know, this war has happened and in, in the frustration has been that they feel like you're kind of using this tragedy as an as a way to advertise or potentially to launder, you know, Clearview's reputation. This is a company, you know, that is facing legal action on a lot of fronts, the potential for regulation, um, millions of millions of dollars in fines in, in lots of different countries. So what do you say to people who suggest that this is, you know, this you're using this war as a promotional tool? Yeah, so I mean, our intentions, like I said before, were trying to find like many other companies and many other people. There's been an international response to the crisis in Ukraine um, and everyone's been trying to help. So we were just thinking along the same lines. How do we help as a company? How do we provide uh, something that could be you know, um, useful? And the response has been just way um, more than we could ever imagine in terms of uh, the success and the ability we've had uh, to help them. So, I mean, you know, we're a very mission driven company. Um, we support law enforcement here in the United States and um, we've had, you know, our fair share of criticism, but ever since we've had it, what kept us going as a company, what kept us motivated is hearing every day these success stories uh, from our customers like Homeland Security and FBI where they've been able to, you know, ID child molesters. And so I think it's just the natural um, kind of cycle that happens with any new technology where at first it can be misunderstood. So many misunderstandings about uh, what Clearview is and how it works. Like many people think it's a real-time service when they realize it's after the crime investigative service and they're a lot more comfortable with it. And we see major events when January 6 happened and our technology was able to ID many of the capital riders more acceptance of it. So kind of my job and the job of the company is to continue to educate people on how it's actually used in practice. And, and so that way that the legislatures and other more people in government are able to make the right decisions about, you know, how to um, how to regulate this software. We do uh, think regulation is important and any new technology goes through that. So when the car and automobile was invented, there weren't any street signs and no, you know, stop signs, traffic lights or anything like that. Uh, but once we, kind of adopted the technology during in society, had it talks of, about what it's good for, what it's not good for. I mean, you could take a car and drive it into a building or you can get it from A to B. And then, you know, the regulations came along. There have been seat belts, there have been a lot of, you know, safety features. And we think it's the same for facial recognition and we welcome that. And I think that um, what we're here is just to talk about the, you know, good use cases that are possible with it. Um, and we've been really surprised and uh, ourselves every day about all the types of crimes has been able to solve. So uh, when it comes to what we do as a company, you know, we've always been mission driven and using this technology for good and to help people and make uh, society a lot safer. 
Okay. Well, I'm glad to hear you um, welcome regulation. Hopefully lawmakers are watching this and um, can, can pass regulation because there is no federal facial recognition regulation in this country. So anyway, we'll leave it there. Thank you, Juan, for joining us. Um, uh, yeah, thanks for coming on and talking about Ukraine and facial recognition. Thanks a lot, Drew. Really appreciate the time. Yeah, and thank you all for joining us here on Washington Post Live. Um, we will be having more interviews on WashingtonPostLive.com. So uh, join there to register, find out more information about our upcoming programs. But thanks all for joining us.